Kia ora, and welcome to this uh, special spring edition of the Manaki Whenua Link online webinar. And I say that because the weeds in my garden this spring are simply spectacular. So I'm, I'm personally really looking forward to the opportunity for some revenge at the hands of our scientists. Seriously though, um, environmental weeds are taking an insidious hold on our, hold on our native ecosystems, waterways and parks. And to improve our weed busting tools, we need to first understand the biology and ecology of these invaders. Angela Brandt and Dwayne Peltzer lead the charge on weeds at Manaki Whenua. Angela is a senior ecologist with a special interest in the management of non-native plants and how to translate this knowledge into policy and practice. Dwayne led the Winning Against Wildings research program and is now applying that knowledge to other weed invasions. I'm going to hand over to them. I'll be back at the end for your questions. Don't forget to put them in the chat box as soon as you can. Over to you now, Angela. Thank you very much, Christine, and tēnā koutou katoa. Thanks for joining us this morning. So this talk is actually quite timely because a major synthesis, um, international synthesis of biological invasions from the IPBES team was just released last month. And it demonstrates that there are global accelerating impacts of invasive species. And invasive species, including weeds, are major drivers of biodiversity declines, which I'm sure everyone attending today is aware of. Um, but also, of course, they do have important effects on human health, economic activities, and other values, making them really key and important part of biosecurity management to achieve a multitude of outcomes. And a, a challenge for us, of course, is that Aotearoa New Zealand is a very weedy place, even compared to other islands of similar size globally. So circled here are the North and South Islands, which you can see have more naturalized plant species than nearly any other island um, summarized in this figure. And this sheer number of naturalized species in New Zealand is a major problem. It requires better approaches to do better at weed management, and it's an ideal area for linking what research can provide to help improve management. One of the things we've done recently is produce an inventory of the naturalized flora of New Zealand. So we've got approximately 2,300 native plant species in New Zealand, nearly 1,800 naturalized species. And we divided these into four taxonomic groups, dicots, monocots, gymnosperms, and ferns and allies, to look at how different the naturalized flora was in its composition from the native flora. And unsurprisingly, we found it was quite different. Here I'm showing the total number of species in each of these taxonomic groups, as well as the five most speciose families in each of those groups. You can see with the dicots, other than the asteraceae, the naturalized flora looks quite different than the native flora. This is true really across the board, most prominently in the gymnosperms, where we basically replace the podocarps in the native flora with the pines in the naturalized flora. And we looked at this also for the environmental weed list that Doc produced in 2008 as a bit of a proxy for how, like, what are the naturalized plants that are weedy and actually require management. And again, we see these are different than the native flora which has implications for the um, impacts that these species can have. We see differences in you know, uh, the proportion of different growth forms and life history traits as well. More annuals, fewer woody species in the naturalized flora, for example, more vines and climbers in the environmental weeds. What we don't show here is that there are also more than a thousand casual species growing in the wild that have yet to naturalize. So we only expect that this naturalized flora is going to increase over time. To further complicate matters, we also know that weeds don't occur on their own. They're often growing with other weeds. Um, an example from Auckland here is the green goddess arum lily growing right with the brush bottle. And what we see if we look across the plots in the National Vegetation Survey is that for those plots that have at least one non-native one non-native plant species, there at least half of those plots will have more than one non-native plant species. So it's quite common for weeds to co-occur together, even in these more natural areas that tend to get surveyed um, in terms of their biodiversity or ecosystem. 
values. And when those weeds are co-occurring, it's not that one weed is strongly, necessarily strongly dominant over the others. The most abundant weed in a plot often has nearly the same, if not less, total cover than all of the subordinate species co-occurring with it. So we know that all of those weeds are there doing something, having some kind of impact when they're at these um, higher abundances, of course, but also they could be interacting with each other and producing greater effects than if they grew on their own. This also produces challenges for management because there isn't just one weed to be dealing with in any particular plant community. So lots of challenges for management, research, and potential impacts. And due to all of this going on, um, and challenge, especially challenges with weed management in the um, to protect native ecosystems, the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment conducted an investigation um, that was released in 2021 that looked at across the entire biosecurity system, interviewed researchers, agencies, community groups, anyone involved in managing weeds to think about how could we make the system better. And I was seconded to the team that conducted this investigation and it was quite an exciting experience to see what is happening and what some of our opportunities are to really make some gains. So those recommendations from the Parliamentary Commissioner fell into three main categories. The first was in terms of improving leadership, including policy and in coordination of management across agencies and nationwide. Second was improving data integration and accessibility for those managing weeds. And third was really thinking about how we could more proactively and better tackle emerging weeds. And a couple of these particular recommendations where I think there's quite a bit of opportunity for research to contribute to improving the system is in terms of engagement, coordination, really linking people um, with the science tools and um, approaches that could help manage the problem. And also thinking about that kind of emerging risks. What do we, what can we do better to think about preventing or getting on top of future problems a bit earlier? So some of what we can do in this space will actually build on knowledge that we have gained on in looking at some of the worst weeds we face in New Zealand. And I'll transfer to Duane to talk a bit about work on wild encounters. Hey, thanks, Angela. Kia ora, everyone. Um, we're trying to tag team, so I'll do a few slides about wildings and then we'll we'll hand it back to Angela towards the end. So um, changing tax slightly. So yeah, we, we talk about wilding conifers, but I mean, there's lots to learn about how we should approach weeds, lots of other types of weeds from that work. And I'll just back up a step is, you know, where did these things come from? And that gives us some awareness so that it's not a biology problem. It's also a people involvement issue. So um, what this figure shows is a sort of a global analysis of how reliant are countries on introduced or non-native tree species for a whole range of services. That could be erosion control, there's lots of soil conservation plantings, timber and so on. And the red arrow shows New Zealand up the top end alongside South Africa, Chile and a few other countries where we're heavily reliant on things like our plantations being dominated by non-native species. That's quite a contrast to other sorts of countries that look down to the right, like Japan, the United States, Canada, North America, where um, <clears throat> Angela and I originally <laughs> came from. But uh, it does just say we have a huge introduction effort, and it's not accidental. It's for deliberate um, benefits. So I might go to the next. One of the downsides, though, of this big introduction effort, climate matching, all the sort of well-documented, um, you know, uh, inclusion of non-native species that they can create issues. This one, a lot of you on the call are probably aware of, it's the rate of the issue. So yeah, this is three years. This is uh, up above Henmer Springs. For those that know the Clarence River, it's mostly Pinus contorta in uh, both photos. It's the speed of the invasion and the sort of landscape change that has really brought something like wilding conifers to the fore. Um, and it's you know, received an amazing amount of both management and research in, in recent years. So I might go to the next. So I guess from a research point of view, um, one thing we'll come with the call today is it's always better to get in early in the invasion. We know this, but it's hard to do in practice. And with the wilding conifers, there was certainly a lot of work and management, but it came to a head with the national strategy. Um, where there's a partnership 
um, different managers came together, but there was still a research gap in how do we do a better job of managing weeds, everything from good practice guides to what does better control look like through to, um, you know, what are these impacts on diversity uh, and so forth. So putting some data behind what is the management accomplishing. And it's quite collaborative. So the other thing is it's not just a Manaki Fenua or a Scion or a university issue, it's integrating across um, lots of different talents, if you like. And the reason why is, is that, um, you know, to do an integration across, we say, ecology management and things like modeling and forecasting, you know, requires those diverse teams. All right. Don't worry about the detail. It's a very busy slide, but there is a lot of evidence produced in these research programs, these major MB endeavors, which um, in some ways we can use large scale invasions like conifers to tell us about, well, what happens early versus late in an invasion? What are the effects on diversity? And that's the sort of figures off to the right. The scale matters. So you can get different diversity effects at a patch versus um, a catchment versus a whole region. And so the scale of these things matters. Uh, but I mean, fundamentally, we produce quite a lot of data. If anybody wants to know more about some of these things, I mean, that's, that's something to follow up with. But certainly there's uh, rapid impact straight away. And there's also legacies, which we'll talk about next. So aside from the research, this broad scale management, many of you may have been involved or seen, I mean, it is a massive effort to control wilding conifers. They're large weeds, they're at big scale. Um, it's expensive for starters, it's not a cheap exercise. It's long-term, I and mean, we were talking decades for some areas like Mid-Dome and others and, and ongoing efforts. And these legacies that I talk about are, there's no one-off solution. There's no, we just have to control them 100% once. Um, and it's done, it's a repeat. And so one of these MB programs is about reinvasion, which is an acknowledged problem that um, you can manage once and there's a second wave. And sometimes it can be different species coming in the second or third waves. And so you're in for a long haul of management. Um, so what we've done is bundled up everything that we knew about wilding conifers and what are the options for that reinvasions or alternatives to managing the weeds. It could be pasture, it could be native restoration. Um, in a New Zealand Ecological Review. So that's just shown here for those that are interested. We talk about people, and again, wildings is, is no absence. It's partly from the um, way things were introduced, where they were introduced, even some of the headlines from the national strategy are right tree in the right place. And what that implies is that sometimes it's the wrong place for tree species. And so that depends not just on the biology, but on people's perceptions. One of the, you know, top, the top two species in plantation, radiata and Douglas fir, um, are also weeds in the right place, or in some places. And so Peter Bellingham led, uh, you know, a paper saying, well, radiata actually is an invader, which surprised some people. But actually communities and a lot of management have said, yes, it is a weed in some locations. And so then what do we do about it? Because we're in an unusual situation where it's a major plantation species, there's lots of benefits. But in the wrong place, it's also weed. So it's managing people's expectations and some of those conflicts, the potential conflicts. And that's quite broad spread across the invasion literature. But how do we manage people and the potential conflicts in their management? So while we're dealing with the obvious wilding conifers in the background, there is still naturalization going on. And that's kind of shifting gears in the webinar here, which is it's always most efficient, where you could think of it as the best. Uh, uh, cost to benefit ratio is catching them very early when they're just naturalizing. This is this long list of species Angela showed earlier. That is by far the most effective and cheapest time to get them, but it's it's hard. For the conifers though, Clayson Howell put together a review that said about every two years we get a new conifer species naturalizing. So that is absolutely the cheapest and the most effective thing to do is to tackle those new naturalizations, but it's actually very difficult to do in practice. And that's one of the challenges that we're really keen to, to pursue next. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Dwayne. So yes, just as Dwayne highlighted, we've we know, we've learned a lot about wild and conifers, and there are some other weeds we know quite a lot about. But then we have these hundreds of other naturalized species and weeds to deal with. So how can we apply what we know to the hundreds of other weeds? much less the potential weeds of the future. Um, for example, we know that that 
1,800 or so naturalized plant species that I mentioned earlier aren't evenly distributed across the country. Some regions have a greater number than others, and they also have different species. Um, but those can change. We know that uh, there are numbers something like, okay, well, every two years one new conifer might naturalize, but across all the non-native plants, we could get upwards of 20 new naturalizations a year. Um, so we know there's more, more coming on the horizon. Um, and similarly for the species that then also become weedy or require management because we see they're having impacts. Um, the environmental weeds list we used here was from 2008, but DOC has updated that list. It has dozens more environmental weeds on it. So we know that there are more weeds coming and how can we plan for looking um, earlier on the invasion curve for a larger array of species. And this need to be more proactive was one of those things highlighted in the Parliamentary Commissioner's 2021 report, where we do expect the future is likely to exacerbate weed invasion and weed impacts, um, as well as problems we face with managing weeds. That'll be in terms of getting more species, having localized species spread, um, and a lot of this can then interact or be promoted by or interact with land use change or climate change. Um, in addition to the increased stress that our native ecosystems um, and native species could face under these conditions. So that might further exacerbate impacts from other pressures like weed invasion. So what we're looking to do now is thinking about what kinds of research can we do um, across sort of the broader group of weeds um, in terms of filling knowledge gaps, but also helping to shift that management to become more proactive, think, um, help managers think about future weeds and, and how to deal with them. And these future weeds can include those new naturalizations. They could include species that are currently localized, but it could expand their range in the future. Um, so become a problem in regions where they haven't yet been a problem. Um, and that could be, for example, we see you know, new naturalizations of tree lomatia around Wellington, um, Chilean myrtle, Luma apiculata, becoming a problem um, around the Tasman District, um, Cajon National Park, for example. So different places are gonna face different challenges from different new weeds. But this is still a national issue um, with those different challenges for local communities across Aotearoa, New Zealand. So we're looking at a couple of different approaches to how we can address this with future research, including putting in a new proposal for an MB Endeavor program. And we'd love to hear from anyone who manages weeds on what your priorities and needs are. So do keep an eye out for the survey link that will come out in the follow-up email to this webinar. And with that, I think we're ready for questions. Great. Thanks, uh, Angela and Duane. We've got questions for both of you coming up, but but I'm just going to start with one of my own. Um, do you have a favourite or maybe unfavourite weed? And I love that question. Um, it is hard to pick a favourite, but I think for me, one thing that really highlights the um, people and ecology side, um, that there are both sides to the weeds problem, is that point about how um, a lot of people have that different affinity for different weeds. There's these different values around different weeds. Um, and as Wayne alluded to, we're, you know, imports from North America. And so I do have a little bit of an internal conflict and struggle in terms of the lupins when I see them in um, the Mackenzie District and so on, because of course they're native in my home state of Oregon in the US. So it is that point about, you know, weed is really about what's the place the plant is in and what is what is it doing in that ecosystem um, and kind of working through, you know, what are my internal feelings or values around that, and, you know, and thinking about that then in terms of my work. Um, and I think Duane has a good story about this kind of thing too. <laughs> Everybody loves Pinus contorta, don't they? <laughs> it's um, it's the weed we love to hate, and for a couple of reasons. I mean, it is undeniably one of the worst weeds in New Zealand, but it's also a conservation issue. Where I did my PhD in Saskatchewan, where it was sort of a little relic. Um, it was it was seen as a major restoration trial, 
And I guess the other little thing is it's a global, globally introduced. And so it's actually been an excuse to work with people from uh, you know, Europe. It's cropped up in Iceland as an afforestation species, Chile. So actually just comparing notes about how different people or countries tackle the same species has been fascinating. Great. Now, I think we've got some other ecosystem questions coming up later, but there's one that I'm really particularly interested in because I think this is what I see in my garden. But <laughs> um, Is there kind of a pattern of succession? So, for instance, is there a consistent pioneer species um, that facilitates all that collection of other weeds that seem to pile in together? That's an excellent question. And that is actually... Uh, there's ecological theory about that, um, which is invasional meltdown. So the idea that if you get one species, one, um, and it's not just plant species, but I think not necessarily, but um, really quite useful to think about in terms of one new weed that comes in, it could actually facilitate other weeds to follow it, produce that kind of successional approach. I suppose one example um, that comes to my mind could be nitrogen fixers, where they're really providing um, nutrient enrichment and nutrient for habitats that facilitate some of those other really weedy, nutrient hungry species to come in. Um, but that also makes me think of some other work you've done, Dwayne, um, in braided river systems. <laughs> and if you have more specifics you'd like to share on that. Yeah, I mean, that's a huge question. So yeah, sh sure there are lots of, um, as Andrew says, the nitrogen fixers are a classic. They sort of load up nutrients. We think a lot of weeds are what we'll call um, high on the resource spectrum. So they're, they're nutrient hungry. They grow quickly. They produce a lot of seeds. Um, floodplains, things like Budlia davidii, a butterfly bush would be one we've worked on where it actually increases a lot of phosphorus. And so do you have different succession where you've got phosphorus and nitrogen fixers together? And it um, seems like that is the case. Um, so yeah, certainly lots of weeds would sort of come in, they can stabilize soils and they can do quite a lot with nutrients. Um, the other one that, not our own personal work, but I've worked a lot with Ian Dickey on mycorrhizae and mutualis is that they come with associated species. So they could have different mycorrhizae and so forth. Sometimes that can facilitate other species, sometimes that can, can slow them down. Great, and this, this leads on nicely to this next question. Is it possible for new weeds to outcompete the established weeds, or does any introdu new introduction just add to the problem? That's an excellent question. And yes, it can happen. Um, it can happen um, commonly after a weed is controlled, which is um, some of the work uh, we've been thinking about doing as well, but also, um, and is kind of in established uh, being worked on with conifers and also in some other systems but actually in some cases a weed can actually just take over from the original weed it does it does depend um i think a lot on what kind of weeds are you starting with you, a classic example could be overtopping by woody weeds if you've just got herbaceous weeds underneath but um but yeah it can go either way facilitating new ones or taking over um and that's how you see that succession happening. I don't know if you have examples you've seen, Dwayne. There's heaps. These are huge questions. <laughs> so it'll be interesting to follow up on some of them for, for who's ever interested. But I guess um, we're still in this. I'll, I'll take a slightly different take is, you know, we're doing quite a bit of work currently on things like understory invasions and forests. They're always seen as never really a major problem. And yet we think it's just about the lags, that actually with storms and disturbance and there is propagules, they're, they're sort of further from sources of most propagules, it's just a time issue. Um, and, you know, Angela's earlier slide showing actually even in forests or nibs plots, there is two or three or four species. That's not a lot to worry about, but it doesn't seem like they're sort of um, um, suppressing one another yet. So they may, they may never come to a lot, or it might just be that it's too early in the piece and we haven't actually seen that. I think there's lots of, um, you know, weeds that will come and go as well. So there's work Jeff Diaz and others that said, you know, just because a weed's been big doesn't mean it's going to persist. Some of them crash. And so actually knowing when invasions fail is really, really crucial. And that's not something we even mentioned in the webinar, which is accumulation of pathogens and, you know, intentional use of biocontrol and the like. So, 
there's certainly invasions that um, for a whole lot of reasons do crash. Now, I think this one might be for you, Dwayne, and it might be a bit big, but are there any overlaps in weed control and synergies with pest control? Now that is a big one, and um, <laughs> I'll just I'll just give a, a single response now and again. Quite happy to have longer debates on these things that this require, but I think they're actually quite separate. Um, I mean, I certainly dabbled in predator-free, do a bit in ungulates, and I would say weeds are always to one side. You know, things are either weed-centric or animal-centric. There's a real division in effort, and there's certainly work now where, well, how do we put these together, not just for the research but the management? So, you know, does it make sense to manage animals and weeds in the same locations? What do we get by doing that than if we tackle them separately? Um, so one example I could give was, again, with the conifers, just because we've worked on it so much as lots of drawing would be, we know that the conifers require mycorrhizae to establish and spread, and those are moved around by animals. And so could you slow an invasion by managing your animals and the weeds at the same time? In some locations, that might be an option. Probably where things are long established, it wouldn't be. Um, so there, there's probably examples where we think, yeah, it would make a lot of sense to consider those together. Ungulates and weeds and their effects are certainly one that's kind of ripe for, for a bit of consideration. Yeah. Great. And now maybe a, just time for one last question. Um, Angela, do you consider that native species could be weeds? And under what circumstances? That is an excellent question. Um, and I, I should mention that um, in the environmental weeds list that I presented from DOC, we included only non-native species, but there are a couple of native plants that do get controlled as weeds in certain um, reserves, depending on what they do. So if you think about, um, so I think it actually harkens back a bit to Dwayne's point about right tree in the right place. Like when we think about those kinds of things, it's really about what does weed mean? And there are some really great conversations about that going on now and we're thinking about that as as a theme within the research going forward as well because it is about what's happening in a place it's about the values it's about what's going on with the whole system um, before something is a weed where maybe it requires some management because of what it's doing and so in that sense yes native species something that is native to new zealand could be starting to do something differently if we introduce it to a different ecosystem or a different part of New Zealand or because land use change, climate change, all those things start making it behave differently where where it's not in sort of that balance or working with the ecosystem. So it, it's definitely possible. It's something we're not quite delving into as much or not planning to within our current research because we already find thinking about those values and potential conflicts with even the non-native plants is is a bit of a challenge, but but it is another point about we need to keep having conversations and talk about some of these tough tough things and think about how all these different human perceptions as well as what's happening ecologically, those interact. We have to put all that together. Fabulous. We have got some amazing questions here. So um, rest assured to all of those who have asked the questions and those who have said, yeah, that's interesting. Um, what we will do from here is um, collate some responses to those questions and we will share those back on our website. Ilona, thank you very much for some of the um, tips and uh, notifications that you've put into the chat box as well. Um, I'm going to look at, to see if we can share those quickly in the follow-up email that comes out after this, um, this webinar. The, uh, so watch your inbox for the follow-up email. That will certainly have um, some links to the survey that will be another way that keeps you connected with our research direction, even a chance to maybe influence it and, um, and keep you connected with a community of, huge community of interest uh, in weeds. That's us for 2023. We will be back with more Link Online webinars in 2024. Um, till then, 
I know it's a bit early. Merry Christmas. We are over and out for this year. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.